Assalamu alaikum dear brothers and sisters wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh I'd like to welcome you all to our first session on the tafsir of Surah Fatir and uh, before we begin I just want to share some general background information about the surah so Surah Fatir is the 35th chapter of the Quran in its sequential order, meaning in the way that it's ordered in the Uthman Taha uh, script and the, in the Qurans that we have with us, the Mus'haf, it's the 35th surah. And it's a relatively short surah in that it only contains 45 verses. So it's about, you know, it's a few pages long. Now, chronologically, Surah Fatir is believed by some of the Mufassirin to have been revealed immediately after Surah Al-Furqan, which is the 25th chapter of the Qur'an. So we're looking at a Surah that was revealed during the early, during the middle Meccan period. And the reason why we say that is because the Meccan period lasted for approximately 13 years. And during the early years, you know, so for three years, the prophet was preaching in secret. And in the first couple of years, when he made his uh, public announcement, when he started to propagate his message in public spaces, the Meccans, the Meccan elites, the Quraysh didn't really take the prophet seriously. They dismissed the, the Muslims as a small group that wasn't going to gain any momentum. But from the content of the surah, you see that this most likely is a, uh, a surah that was revealed during the middle Meccan period because of the hostility that is being shown to the Prophet. So you can see that there is tension growing between the... the uh, the Muslim community and the the Meccan elites. So this is probably about five or six years after the Ba'tha, roughly. Now, as I mentioned, Surat Fatir is a Meccan surah, and and this is and what's characteristic about Meccan surahs is that they focus heavily on establishing a correct belief system. And this is the beauty of Islam. You see that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala first wants to, He wants us to think correctly. He wants to, He wants to correct our ideology, our world, our world view, because of the way that we think, the way that we think about our origin, the way that we think about God, the way that we think about the hereafter, our thoughts and our beliefs shape our behavior. So this is why the, the legislation of Islamic rituals came later on. So the, the foundation first has to be established. So Surah Fatir is a Meccan surah which focuses heavily on establishing a correct belief system and debunking false ideologies. Now, the surah takes its name from the first verse where there is a reference to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala being Fatr al-Samawati wal ard So this is where the name of the surah is derived. Now, surah Fatr is also, if you look at some of the ahadith, you'll see that it's also called, it's also referred to as Surah Al-Mala'ika, the chapter of angels, because, because many, uh, because in the first verse, there is a very unique, there is a very unique description of, of angels that are, uh, that are given. And some scholars see this verse as the only description of the physical appearance of angels in the Quran. And inshallah, when we get to that part of the verse, we'll speak about whether or not the, uh, the, the, the description of their wings 
is uh, is in fact a, a physical uh, description or not. We'll get into that shortly. So Surah Fatir, Surah 35 of the Quran, it's a middle Meccan Surah, meaning it was revealed during the middle of the Meccan period. It focuses heavily on Usul al-Din, especially the three core uh, principles of our belief system, the oneness of Allah, the oneness of God, uh, the hereafter, and prophethood. And of course, Imama and, and Adil are essentially extensions of these, uh, these three. Now, when, when it comes to the major themes of this chapter, you find that there are certain themes that emerge. Number one, one of the dominant themes of this surah is the affirmation of God as the sole originator and provider. So there are certain dimensions of tawheed that will be elucidated in this surah. So it's not that he, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the sole creator, but he's also the sole provider. So there's the this notion of rububiyya. Next, we have another major theme in this surah is contrasting the power of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with the claim the polytheists make for their idols. So there is this, this demonstration of this, this huge disparity between Allah's power and the perceived power of, of the idols, of things that people take as objects of worship. A part of the surah also speaks about shaitan. And we're introduced to shaitan in the surah as a great deceiver or a deluder and a sworn enemy of human beings. And then another major theme is the, the contrast, contrasting the state of mu'mineen and kuffar, contrasting the state of believers and disbelievers in dunya as well as in akhirah. And we'll see that the, the contrast in the hereafter will be more pronounced. There will be, there, there will be a sharper contrast uh, with respect to the state of believers and disbelievers uh, in the hereafter. As with almost every surah in the Quran, we have a certain genre of traditions that speak about the merits of reciting various chapters of the Quran, some of the spiritual benefits, some of the rewards that have been promised. And you know, oftentimes people ask about the authenticity of these traditions. And my response is that the authenticity of the narrations that speak about the reward that is promised to those, to those who recite these chapters is not really significant. And the reason why I say that is because we have a tradition, an authentic riwayah from, for example, Imam al-Baqir and it's known as uh, Riwayat uh, Manbalagh. And these are traditions where the Imams have said that if, if you come across a tradition from the Prophet or from the Ahlul Bayt and they have mentioned a specific reward for a specific action and you perform that action in hope of attaining that reward, you will receive that reward even if the Prophet or the Imams didn't actually say it. So you can act on it and receive the thawab, but you cannot say that 100% without a doubt the Prophet made the statement or the Imams made the statement. So this is, you know, uh, this is a narration where the Imams say that if news reaches you of the reward for, for, for an action, for a, a dua or a type of salah, a type of, you know, any type of deed that has a reward attached to it, and you do it in hopes of attaining that reward, Allah, out of His generosity and, and His mercy, He will grant you that reward, even if, in reality, the, the Prophet or the Imams didn't actually make that statement. So 
and, and these are authentic traditions where the Imams say that if you act on a tradition because you believe that it's possible that the Prophet or the Imams made that statement, you will be granted that reward even if in fact they, uh, they did not say that. So there is a tradition from the Prophet where he speaks about the fadila, the merits of Surat Fatir. He says, Man qara'a surat al malaika. So here you see that Surat Fatir is, is known in some of the traditions as Surat al malaika, the chapter of angels. Man qara'a surat al malaika. دَعَتْهُ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ ثَلَاثَةُ أَبْوَابٍ مِنَ الْجَنَّةِ Whoever reads the chapter of angels, which is this chapter, Surah Al-Malaika or Surah Fatir, three gates of paradise call upon him, saying, أَنِدْخُلْ مِنْ أَيِّ الْأَبْوَابِ شئت. Enter from any gate, you wish. Now, of course, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is able to make all things, even the things that we perceive as inanimate, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can enable them to communicate. Now, one point of, of reflection here is that why is it that the one who reads this surah, three gates call upon him, call out to him, then enter from what any gate you wish, from among the three, why eight? Why uh, why three gates? Now we know from various riwayat, various traditions, that there are eight gates of paradise. And here, this tradition says the one who recites Surah Al Malaika, three of those gates call upon him, saying that you can enter from any any gate of the three that you wish. Now, because Surah Fatir deals heavily with usul al-din and usul al-din are are three now usul al-madhab are five but usul al-din the three things that you have to believe in to qualify you as a muslim are three someone who believes in the oneness of allah they believe in uh, so tawhid ma'ad and risala someone who believes in these three is muslim now, for someone to be a mu'min, to be on the madhab of Ahlul Bayt, you have to include imama and adl. But in any case, because Surah Fatir or Surah al malaika deals with these three core beliefs, you find that it seems some scholars have suggested that because it deals with these three areas of aqidah, that, uh, that a person... Is, uh, is honored by entering uh, th- uh, any of those three gates that he wishes. And of course, the other gates of paradise, you know, there are many names for them. Some of the gates of paradise are known as, you know, the gate of patience or the gate of the mujahideen. And many of them are related to actions. But these, uh, these gates uh, possibly uh, are, uh, are gates through which those who have a proper aqidah uh, are able to enter. So we begin with uh, the first verse, and uh, there's a lot to cover, and we might have to continue our uh, conversation on this verse, inshallah, next week. So the uh, verse number one, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Alhamdulillahi fatir as-samawati wal-ard, ja'il al-malaikati rusula, uli ajnihatim mathna wa thulatha wa ruba'ah, يزيد في الخلق ما يشاء إن الله على كل شيء قدير. Praise be to God, originator of the heavens and the earth, who appoints the angels as messengers of wings two, three, and four, increasing creation as He will. Truly, God is powerful over all things. The surah begins with Alhamdulillah. Now there are five chapters in the Quran that begin with the expression of Alhamdulillah. 
and they are uh, Surah Al-Fatiha, Surah Al-An'am, Surah Al-Kahf, and Surah Fazl. I just realized that there are only uh, four. There's also uh, another one. I believe Surah, uh, maybe Surah Saba. So these are, there are a number, there are five chapters in the Quran that begin with the praise of God, that begin with the, the expression Alhamdulillah. Now, what is the meaning of Alhamdulillah? So it means praise be to God. But what is, what is the implication of the statement? Now, Alhamdulillah, of course, we, we spoke about this uh, at length when we, when, we, uh, when we covered the tafsir of Surah Al-An'am. But very briefly, Alhamdulillah is an expression of reverence and gratitude. And it's important for us to keep both of these in mind. It's an expression of reverence and gratitude to God for who He is and what He does and what He has bestowed upon His creatures. Now, you know, sometimes when you express gratitude, you express gratitude because of something that someone did. But with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, even if He doesn't do anything, He is still worthy of, of praise because of who He is. It's not even related to what He does or a, spe or a specific bounty. It's deeper than that. It's this combination of reverence and gratitude. And there are a plethora of narrations that speak of the merits and spiritual benefits of this sacred utterance. If you look at the ahadith, you'll find tens and tens of uh, narrations that speak about the, the value and, and the weightiness of uh, the expression Alhamdulillah. But for the sake of brevity, I'll share with you this uh, beautiful tradition that's, that uh, Sheikh, uh, Sheikh al Saduq in his famous book, Thawab uh, al-A'mal wa Iqab al-A'mal, the reward for, for deeds and the punishment for deeds. So he, he mentions many ahadith where the imams of Ahlul Bayt speak about the rewards for certain actions. Now among the narrations that are mentioned is the following. رُوِيَ أَنَّهُ جَاءَ رَجُلٌ إِلَىٰ أَبِي عَبْدِ اللَّهِ عَلَيْهِ السَّلَامِ it is reported that a man came to our sixth Imam, an Imam al Sadiq. Faqal ju'il tu fidak. This is an expression of adoration, of love. May, may I be sacrificed for you. And, and this, is, this was very common in the Arabian culture. It's an expression of, of deep love and devotion. Ju'il tu fidak, inni shaykhun kabir. I'm an elderly man, he says to Imam al Sadiq. فَعَلِّمْنِي دُعَاءً جَامِعًا He says, I'm an elderly man. And it seems from the narration that he's trying to say to the imam that I don't have the energy or the time to recite lengthy prayers or lengthy supplications. Can you give me, can you teach me something, a dua that is all-encompassing, that is potent and is comprehensive in its scope? What does the Imam say? Faqal Ahmedillah. Praise Allah. Say basically say Alhamdulillah. Praise Allah. Fa innaka idha hamittallah. Because if you praise Allah, if you say Alhamdulillah and you're cognizant of its meaning and you reflect on its meaning and you say it with your heart and with your mind. And with every ounce of your being. Such a beautiful hadith. The Imam says, when you say Alhamdulillah, there is not every he says, every single person who prays makes dua for you. All of the Musalleen make dua for you. Why? 
لم يبقى مصل إلا دعا لك يعني قوله سمع الله لمن حمده you know when, when we pray when a person prays and they go down in, uh, for ruku' they bow when they raise their head from ruku' what do they say سمع الله لمن حمده God hears those who praise him meaning God he accepts it from them so when someone says Alhamdulillah, they earn the dua of all of the worshippers. Imagine the value of this. لم يبق مصل إلا دعا لك يعني قوله سمع الله لمن حمده. And you know, during the غيبة, this even includes the dua of the twelfth Imam, when the Imam raises his head, his noble head from ruku. He says, Sami Allahu liman hamid. So if even if you even if no one prays, just the fact that Imam Sahib al Zaman says Sami Allahu liman hamid, this is a dua from him for all of those who say Alhamdulillah. So you know we, we often want people to pray for us. If you want the most noble people to pray for you, if you want the, the people who do salah. The worshippers to include you in their dua, be among those who praise Allah. Say Alhamdulillah. Get into the habit of expressing this, this, uh, this gratitude and this reverence uh, for Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. So Alhamdulillah, Fatir al-Samawati wal-Ard. Now, one of the Asma ul Husna, the beautiful. Names of Allah, one of the 99 names of Allah. And there are more names than 99, but the 99 are, are the most well-known. One of them is Al-Fatir. Now, Al-Fatir comes from the verb Fatara. And Fatara literally means to split or to cleave. Now, in the Qur'an... Fatr, and those for those of you who took Arabic grammar with me, you know that this is uh, ism fa'il, Fatr. Fatr in the Quran always, whenever you see the name Fatr, it's all it always occurs as part of the phrase as samawati wal ard. Fatr as samawati wal ard. So the, the the name Fatr is always accompanied. It's always a part of the expression the originator of the heavens and the earth. So what did Allah split? What did he cleave? The heavens and the earth. Now, what does it mean when we say Allah is Fatir al-Samawati wal Now, keeping, keeping in mind the meaning of the verb Fatara, which means to split, what does it mean when we say that he split the heavens and the earth, or he cleaved the heavens and the earth. Now, some of the commentators, some of the mufassireen, they maintain that the usage of fatr here is metaphorical. And it refers to the splitting open, to splitting open the darkness of non-existence with the light of existence. You know, if you think of the sunrise, it's pitch black, it's pitch black, and then you see the rays of the sun, and it, it's almost as though the rays of the sun are splitting the darkness. So some ulama say that فَاطِرِ samawati wal ard means that he brought the heavens and the earth into existence from non-existence. It's as though Allah split open the darkness of non-existence with the light of existence. This is one possible meaning. This is one meaning that is put forward by some mufassirin. Others, and this is this next opinion is mentioned by the famous Sunni mufassir of the Quran. Al-Fakhru razi in his Tafsir Al-Tafsir Al-Kabir. Him and maybe even some of some Shia scholars, but he's known for this opinion. He says that 
when we say that Allah is Al-Fatir, that Allah is the one who splits open the heavens and the earth, it means that He cleaves open the heavens to prepare the descent of the arwah into the bodies. Now, because the arwah, because the spirits that give us life come from those higher realms that they enter into alam dunya because of this because of this splitting and allah is also the one who splits open the earth for the ascension of the arwah at the moment of qiyamah so the heavens are split to allow the arwah to descend into the bodies and the earth is split that allah splits open the earth to for, for people to be resurrected and to begin the hisab of the day of judgment. This is one opinion. This is another opinion. Now, with the advent of modern science, it's also possible for us to, to understand this verse using the, uh, the scientific data that, that we have today about the, uh, the beginning stages of the universe. Now, from a scientific perspective, the notion of splitting the heavens and the earth is, in fact, consistent with the Big Bang Theory. Why? Because according to the Big Bang Theory, the universe, the heavens and the earth, the universe in its entirety was a single mass. It was one single mass with infinite density, as some scientists say. And it was split open. And it was this cleaving, this splitting that allowed the universe to expand into its current form. This is also another possibility. In any case, and there's no reason for us to limit the scope of the verse to one particular instant. You know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is... He's also the one who splits open the seeds and when things grow from the earth, this is also a type of you know, a splitting of the earth. When the, when the rain falls from the, uh, the sky, this is also a type of, of splitting. So there's no, there's no need for us to, to say, especially in the absence of any narrations from the Ahlul Bayt, particularly about the meaning of this verse, there's no reason for us to say with certainty that the meaning of Fatr is, is such and such. That it seems to be general and we have many instances where uh, we can uh, we see this, this attribute of Fatr al-Samawati wal-Ard being uh, manifested. Therefore, when we say Alhamdulillahi Fatr al-Samawati wal-Ard, we praise and we express our awe in the face of this supreme being who split the heavens and the earth, whatever meaning that we want to ascribe to that, he split the heavens and the earth and bestowed upon us existence and the innumerable blessings that accompany the gift of existence. Alhamdulillahi Fatir al-Samawati wal-Ard Ja'il al-Mala'ikati Rusula Who appoints the angels as messengers. This is a very interesting verse because when we think about angels, there are really only a few angels that come to mind. So, for example, when, we, when you think about an angel who functions as a messenger, typically the, the, the only angel that comes to mind is Jibra'il because he is the messenger of Allah to the messengers of Allah. So he's, you know, Ar-Ruh Al-Ameen. He is the trustee of revelation and Allah dispatches him to deliver messages to prophets and the prophets in turn deliver that message to their communities. So we often associate only Jibra'il as an angel who functions as a messenger. However, in this ayah, 
the Quran asserts that all angels are in fact messengers. Al-Iflam here means all malaika, all angels are messengers. Now, what does this mean? What type of messages are they carrying and delivering? What type of risala is this? Is this a risala tashri'i? Is this a legislative message? Like the messages that Jibra'il would bring to the Prophet? Or is it creative messages? So for example, you know, when the ability the, the ability of plants to undergo photosynthesis, this is this is information that they have. That information, where does it come from? So this is an example of creative messages that allow different parts of creation to function. So when we think about angels, it's important for us to get out of this mindset that Jibra'il is a messenger and, and other angels, they don't really have a role to play. Allah says all of them are messengers. All of them function, they fulfill, they represent God in certain tasks, meaning that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives them certain responsibilities, certain legislative or creative messages and they they govern his creation on his behalf now here are some examples of angels other than jubrail who are described as messengers in the quran so for example in surat in surat yunus allah says inna rusulana yaktubuna ma tamkurun Indeed, our messengers are recording whatever they plot. So the angels that record the scribes are messengers, meaning that they have been given this task by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They're messengers. In Surah Al-An'am, ayah number 61, rusuluna." Till when death comes to you, our messengers. So you see, with death, we often think that it's only Malakul Maut, the angel of death, Israel, but we find that he also has aids. These are messengers who are dispatched by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to fulfill a certain task. So the angels who are scribes are, are called messengers. The angels who remove the souls from the physical bodies they're called messengers. They're, they're sent on behalf of God to, because that is a messenger. If I send a messenger, that means this person is acting on my behalf. They're fulfilling a task on my behalf. Surah 29, Surah Al-Ankabut, verse 31. وَلَمَّا جَاءَتْ رُسُولُنَا إِبْرَاهِيمَ بِالْبُشْرَى and when our messengers came to Ibrahim with glad tidings. So this was what? This was a, uh, they gave him the glad tidings of the birth of uh, Ismail or, or Ishaq, for example. قَالُوا إِنَّا مُهْلِكُوا أَهْلِ هَذِهِ الْقَرْيَةِ إِنَّ أَهْلَهَا كَانُوا ظَالِمِينَ So this is uh, Ya'qub. Uh, this is Ishaq, I'm sorry. So when our messengers came to Ibrahim with glad tidings, they said, we shall surely destroy the people of this town. Truly its people are, uh, are wrongdoers. So here, again, the description of messengers is given to the angels who came to give uh, Ibrahim the glad tidings of a son and also to give him the, uh, the information that this community will suffer divine chastisement. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, so he describes them as messengers. They are the messengers of God. Allah commissions them to perform certain tasks, to, to deliver either legislative messages or creative messages. 
And then Allah describes these angels. He says, Uli mathna wa wa ruba' yazidu fil khalqi ma yasha' inna Allah ala kulli shay'in qadir of wings two, three, and four, meaning the, the, the wings of angels, increasing in creation as he will. Truly God is powerful over all things. Now, this ayah has generated a lot of discussion among the, the mufassirin. And this is really one of the few verses in the Quran, or perhaps the only verse in the Quran that gives us such a... a uh, a detailed description of the, the appearance of angels. Now, some commentators have understood these descriptions to be literal. We have some scholars who say that the Quran says that they have wings, therefore they have wings. There's no need for us to ascribe a metaphorical or a, uh, a figurative meaning. There's no... so. Some of them take them, so the, the, more, the more literalist scholars will understand this to, to mean that they physically have wings. Other ulama, they say that no, the wings that are mentioned here are actually figurative, and they're a metaphor for power and rank. Now, Ayatollah Jawadi Amuli believe in this. They believe that these descriptions of angels are figurative. So the scholars who subscribe to a figurative interpretation of this verse, they make the following arguments. Number one, they say that the reason why we interpret this verse figuratively is because mala'ika are not physical beings. Meaning, angels are not physical beings to need physical hands or physical wings. This is number one. So, we have to keep in mind that malaika, some, especially scholars that have philosophical inclinations, like Halama Tawa they say that malaika are are mujudat mujarrada. They are immaterial beings. They are not physical beings. And therefore, when we come across verses like this, we have to interpret them figuratively. That's number one. Now, of course, other scholars like Alam al-Majlisi, the author of Biharul Anwar, he doesn't believe that that angels are immaterial beings. He believes that they're adsam latifa. They are subtle beings, meaning they have they have lighter bodies. And he, for example, would presumably argue that the the descriptions of, of the the wings of angels are literal. Now, going back to the arguments of scholars who believe that the the wings are figurative, they say, for example. Uh, and this is something that uh, Sheikh Mansour al who is who used to be based out of Australia, someone posed this question to him, and these are some of the the answers that he gave, and I thought that it, it was uh, it was a very good answer that he gave, and I'll, I'll I'll share these with you. So the verse confirms. So when you look at the verse, Allah says the angels are uli mathna wa Angels have two wings. Three wings, four wings, or more. And this is what is meant by Yazidu fil Khalqi Ammaisha, increasing in creation as he will. Now, in this context, many scholars have understood that all angels have, most angels seem to have two wings, three wings, or four. This is the norm. Now, there are some exceptional angels who have more wings. And this is what is meant by increasing in creation as he will. Now the verse, so this is a second argument that is put forward by scholars who believe that wings here are figurative. They say the verse confirms the number of their wings, two, three, or four. 
And it's important to keep in mind that all birds or insects who have wings have wings in pairs. You know, when you think about wings, wings, they come in pairs. Birds, you know, or insects, they're either going to have two, four, or some insects might have more wings, six and eight, but they're typically in pairs. This verse confirms the existence of three wings for some angels. So here, this is not, these are not wings that, that are normal because in, in, in creation, that at least what we, what we see is that wings come in pairs. Furthermore, the next part of the verse implies that some angels may have more wings. According to some narrations, there is an angel by the name of Hizqail, not Jibrail, Hizqail, who has 18,000 wings. And the distance between each wing is 500 years. Now, these are massive creatures. There are other angels in narrations with 600,000 wings. Now, all of this suggests that the wings of angels are of a different nature. It's not, you know, just... So we're not talking about the physical wings that you and I are familiar with. So, as I mentioned, scholars like Allama Taba Tabai, Ayatollah Jawadi Amuli, who's, who's a student of Allama, they believe that ajniha, that wings, when, when they're used for angels, they refer to their spiritual status and different abilities for ascension and descent. Thus, the number of their wings determines their rank. So this is kind of a symbolic, it's a metaphor for their maqam. Okay. Because not all angels, you know, the angelic community, the angelic world is not egalitarian. There is a stratification, you know, there is a difference. In, so just like we, we prophets have different ranks, malaika also have different ranks. So therefore, the term is used for them metaphorically with reference to their different abilities and, and statuses. And addition, in addition to that, a similar usage is found in our traditions for Ja'far al-Tayyar. Ja'far, the, the Prophet's cousin, the elder brother of Imam Amir al-Mumin Ali ibn Abi Talib. When he was martyred, when Ja'far was martyred in the battle of Mu'ta. The Prophet says, in lieu of his lost arms, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala granted him two wings to fly in paradise wherever he wishes. Now, does this mean that Ja'far al-Tayyar is going to have physical wings in paradise? Or it's a reference to his high station, that he's not restricted. You know, most people are not allowed to ascend to higher levels, so they're their mobility in the in the paradisal world is restricted they can only occupy certain areas of jannah but those who have who are who are described as having wings they are able to venture into the different parts of paradise so again wings is a is a metaphor for spiritual rank now belief in malaika is actually one of the articles of faith. So if someone, for example, believes in all of the messengers, they believe in the oneness of God, they believe in the Akhirah, but they say, for example, that you know I don't really believe in angels. Such a person will be considered kafir. So iman, believing in the existence of angels, is one of the is one of the articles of faith. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-Baqarah, verse 285, The Messenger has believed in what has revealed to him from his Lord. وَالْمُؤْمِنُونَ And, and, the, and so have the believers. كُلٌّ آمَنَ بِاللَّهِ وَمَلَائِكَتِهِ وَكُتُبِهِ وَرُسُلِهِ All of them have believed in Allah and His angels and His books and His messengers. Now, subhanAllah. The belief in malaika is even mentioned before the belief in God's scriptures and his messengers. 
Why? Because it is the angels who deliver these messages to the prophets. So they are the medium through which Allah reveals sacred scriptures. And it is through the angels that Allah uh, sends revelation to his chosen prophets. Now, since angels are part of Alamul Ghayb, since they are unseen beings, we cannot gather any information about them using empirical knowledge. You know, we can't we can't conduct an experiment or explore the natural world because these are creatures that operate in a different realm. You know, they 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 function and they have a role to play in the physical world, but they're not in essence, they're not physical. Uh, they're not physical creatures. So since they are unseen, we have to rely on wahi to understand their nature. So we look to the Qur'an. What does the Qur'an say about malaika? And what does the ahadith of Ahlul Bayt say? Number one, they are rational, sentient beings. They are purely rational creatures, and they're sentient, meaning they feel emotion. You know, this is why they cry for Imam al Hussein. They experience joy, sadness. They're sentient beings who are honored by God. Surah Al Anbiya, verse 26. We covered this when we spoke about the, when we did the tafsir. Bal ibadum mukramun. They are honored. Honored by who? They're honored by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Number two, the Quran describes them as being fully obedient to God. They never disobey. They never disobey. Not even for a moment. Allah says again in Surah Al-Anbiya, verse 27, They cannot precede him in word. They do not make any judgments until Allah has decreed. And they act by his command. There is no such thing as an angel that goes rogue. They are all in full submission to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Number three, when you look at the Quran, they are given a diverse array of tasks by God. It's not that they all do the same thing. They, they have certain activities that they all engage in, but they are, Allah, there's a division of labor in the angelic world. So some of them carry the throne of God, right? those who carry the, the throne of God. There are some who regulate the natural world. Some of them are in charge of rain, of wind, of veg. There's an angel that is commissioned with the regulation of the different natural forces. Some of them, some of the angels take the souls of people at the time of death. And we mentioned uh, the verse earlier. You know, تَوَفَّتْهُ رُسُولَنَا That our messengers caused them to die. So there are angels whose job is to remove the souls from the body. This is what some malaika, this is the task that Allah has given them. Some angels are scribes, kiram and katibin, right? They record the deeds. Some angels function as guards and protectors of human beings from calamities. There are angels that, that, that protect you. And there are many stories of people who, for example, they're, you know, they're walking and you know, they feel something jolt them and it, it protects them from falling into a ditch or crossing the street and getting hit by a car. We have narrations that's, that's, and there are verses in the Quran that, uh, that attest to this, that the, some angels are given the task of protecting and guarding human beings from certain calamities. Some malaika are specifically responsible for the destruction of rebellious nations. So for example, the community of Lut, the, com uh, the community of Ad, of Thamud, there were certain angels that were dispatched to destroy these nations. Now, of course, they, they were destroyed by, by certain natural forces, but 
there were angels who were who were behind those natural forces. Some malaika aid and support the believers in battle. Allah speaks about the battle of Badr, the battle of Uhud, how angels were descending and they were fortifying the ranks and the hearts of the believers. And of course, some of them deliver revelation to prophets. And of course, Jibra'il is the head of these angels. So in the same way, uh, Israel, the, the angel of death, is the head of the angels of death. Jibra'il is the head of the angels who uh, deliver revelation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Number four, we find in the Quran that they perpetually praise and glorify God. No matter who they are, whether they're the scribes or they're the ones who, who deliver revelation, all of them, this is an activity that they all share, is that they, they glorify Allah. Allah says in Surah Ashura, وَالْمَلَائِكَةُ يُسَبِّحُونَ بِحَمْدِ رَبِّهِمْ لِمَنْ فِي الْأَرْضِ And the angels exalt God with praise of their Lord. And يُسَبِّحُونَ Here, this is fi'l mudara. This is a, a, a present and future tense verb, meaning that this is continuous tasbih. And even their istighfar for the inhabitants of the earth, they, they make istighfar for human beings. They ask Allah to forgive, especially the believers. Number five, we find that they have the ability to appear in physical form by the will of God. So for example, in Surah Maryam, ayah number 17, فَأَرْسَلْنَا إِلَيْهَا رُوحَنَا فَتَمَثَّلَ لَهَا بَشَرًا سَوِيًّا we sent our spirit to her. This is a reference to Jibra'il, who stood before her in the shape of a well-formed human being. So they can take human form. You know, they're very fluid in that they can move, uh, they can move through these different realms. And this is what perhaps why there's there's confusion by some scholars as to whether they're immaterial or they're material or they they have light bodies. From my, my humble observation is that it depends on where they are and what they're doing. So sometimes they might appear in physical form. Other, if they're in the higher realms, then they're, they're essentially purely, uh, they're, uh, they're immaterial. In Barzakh, they might have a certain form. It depends on the environment. You know, in the same way water, sometimes it's liquid, sometimes it's gas, and sometimes it's solid. What determines the shape of water? The environment. Whatever is conducive for that environment. So sometimes an angel takes physical form because that is conducive for that interaction. Other times they might have ajsam latifa because they're, they're inhabiting a world where that is more conducive. And perhaps when they, when they reach the higher realms, they become uh, immaterial. And of course, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. In addition to that, we find from a hadith that they are the most abundant of God's creation. No, so, you know, when in the summertime, you might think that the most abundant thing Allah created are mosquitoes. <laughs> That's not the case. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, he says, مَا مِنْ شَيْءٍ مِمَّا خَلَقَ اللَّهُ أَكْثَرَ مِنَ الْمَلَائِكَةِ Nothing of what God created is more numerous than the angels. So if you were to calculate which creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala exists in the highest abundance, malaika. So alhamdulillah, we can say alhamdulillah, it's not, it's not jinn. So malaika, they're the most populous uh, of all. Uh, they have the highest population of all of God's creation. Again, to highlight the abundance of angels in the world of creation, Imam al-Sadiq, he says, وَالَّذِي نَفْسِي بِيَدِهِ لَمَلَائِكَةُ اللَّهِ فِي السَّمَاوَاتِ أَكْثَرُ مِنْ عَدَدِ التُرَابِ فِي الْأَرْضِ Allahu Akbar. He says, by he, Imam al-Sadiq says, by he 
who owns my soul. It's a qasam he's making. Then, of course, Imam al-Sadiq, Ahlul Bayt, they know because they, they, they can actually see malaika, you know. You know, we, we, when we say upon them, we say that their, their houses are mukhtalaful malaika. The, they are the places that are inhabited regularly by the angels. Imam al-Sadiq says the number of angels in the heavens is more than the amount of sand on earth. If you ever go to the beach, take a handful of sand. That's just one handful. Allah says there are more malaika than all of the grains of sand on earth. And then the Imam says, وَمَا فِي السَّمَاءِ مَوْضِعُ قَدَمٍ إِلَّا وَفِيهَا مَلَكٌ يُسَبِّحُهُ وَيُقَدِّسُ Imam al-Sadiq says, and there is not even the space of a footstep in heaven, in the skies, that does not have an angel glorifying and sanctifying him. Believe me, brothers and sisters, if Allah were to remove the hijab, we would be stunned. And we should, we should really be ashamed with the way that we conduct ourselves, that we are in the presence of all of these noble angels and we act, we act like animals. We act without shame, without decency. And then the Imam says, وَلَا فِي الْأَرْضِ شَجَرٌ وَلَا مَدَرٌ إِلَّا وَفِيهَا مَلَكٌ مُوَكَّلٌ بِهَا Nor is there a tree or a ground without having an angel responsible for it. Every plant, every tree, there is an angel that serves as a guardian over it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't even leave the tree without someone watching it. You think Allah is going to leave human beings without a hujjah after the death of the Prophet? See, this is the beauty of the, the madhab of Ahlul Bayt. That it's, it's this perfectly uh, coherent uh, theology. Angels do not also, they do not eat. They don't drink and they don't copulate. Imam Sadiq says, إِنَّ الْمَلَائِكَةَ لَا يَأْكُلُونَ وَلَا يَشْرَبُونَ وَلَا يَنْكِحُونَ So again, this is also an indication that they're not physical. Because even you and I in Barzakh, we have at Sam Latifa, but we still eat and we still drink. They do not eat, they do not drink, they do not, they don't have, there's no intimacy. And there's no, there's no gender. وَإِنَّمَا يَعِيشُونَ بِنَسِيمِ الْعَرْشِ Rather they subsist, they nourish themselves through the breeze of the throne. And I, and we don't know what this means. So before anyone asks me, Shaykh, what is the meaning of the breeze of the throne? Allahu A'lam, we don't know. Number eight, they do not sleep. They do not experience fatigue and nor are they ever heedless. Imam Amir al-Mu'mineen, he says, in Nahjul Balagha, لَا يَغْشَاهُمْ نَوْمُ الْعُيُونَ وَلَا سَهُوا الْعُقُولَ وَلَا فَتْرَةُ الْأَبْدَانَ وَلَا غَفْلَةُ النِّسْيَانَ So eloquent. The sleep of the eye or the slip of wit or languor of the body, or the effect of forgetfulness does not affect them. That doesn't affect them. And then finally, and inshallah, we'll continue our discussion next week. As, as I've already alluded to, malaika also occupy varying spiritual ranks. They're not all the same. They have different spiritual statuses. Allah says in Surah Safat, and this is basically the angels themselves saying, "Wama minna illa lahu maqamun ma'lum." The angels say there is not among us any except that he has a known position. He has a known maqam, and inshallah, we can uh, continue this conversation. Uh, Next week, I apologize, brothers and sisters, for those of you who know we had a, a death in the family. So I have to, uh, you know, with your permission, sign off and attend to some of the guests. But inshallah, next week, we'll continue our discussion and I'll take any questions that you have from, uh, from this session. Uh, please keep me in your dua. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.